Well, are you guys ready to get into it? We started a series last week. As I said, this year is the year of the Bible. And this is my hope, is that all of you would fall in love with your Bible this year more than you ever have before. And so every series we're doing is going to be out of a book of the Bible. And so this current series is the book of Philemon. And I say book, but it really was a letter that Paul had written to a man named Philemon. And it goes hand in hand with the letter to the Colossian church, what we call the book of Colossians, okay? To review a little bit, Philemon was a convert of, of Paul's, Paul the apostle. He was a wealthy man who started a church in his home with a man named Epaphras. Epaphras was an associate, a contemporary of Paul. Paul actually didn't plant the church in Colossae. Epaphras did. And Epaphras came to Paul while he was in prison in Rome and told him what was happening in the church. So Paul ended up writing a letter to the church in Colossae, but he also sent along with it this personal correspondence to Philemon. Because again, Philemon was one of the founders of the church. He was a, a mature believer that was helping Epaphras to, to establish the work of Christ in the city of Colossae. And so when this letter arrived, it was to be read along with the, the, the letter uh, to, the, to the Colossian church. And although it was a personal correspondence to Philemon, with an appeal from Paul of what he was asking Philemon to do, it was read publicly because the truth that we must understand is that although our faith is private to us, it is also a public declaration. It should emanate in all that we do publicly. Our faith should really in truth lead the way. And so what is it that Paul was asking? See, Paul believed that Jesus, the good news about Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection had implications for life. It should not just impact what we believe, but it should actually transform and change the way we behave, the way we live our lives. And so he's asking Philemon to do something that was unheard of in its time. It was so revolutionary because it was a wrecking ball to the social structures of the way human beings interacted with one another in the ancient days. But now Paul is beholden in this end because what he had written to the Colossians, now he's asking Philemon to actually act upon it, to do what he had given the understanding of what Christ had accomplished for us. But too often, if we're honest, and be honest with me this morning, too often, we're used to in the church world listening to truth, even agreeing with it at times, but having this idea that we mentally assent to it. But the question is, does it ever truly impact the way we live our lives? You see, especially today in the 21st century, modern day Christians treat Jesus more like Burger King than the King of Kings. Because we tend to say sometimes that we'll do what we agree with, but the things we disagree with, we may not necessarily do. But to truly be a follower of Jesus is the understanding that we're now to do it His way. It's not about our way. It's about learning to understand and know that following Jesus, Jesus never told us that it would be easy to follow Him. In fact, when Jesus was here, He said this, to be my disciple, it will require you at times to deny yourself and to take up your cross in other words following Jesus at times can be costly and the truth is when we're impacted by what Christ asks us to do it's usually it well actually not usually it's not negotiable trusting and believing in Jesus is to realize that what he asks us to do is the best way and so sometimes it requires us to do things that we may not want to do we may not agree with doing. But because of his love that he demonstrated for us, because of what he went through to give his life in behalf of us, that we've come to trust him, believe in him, and conform our lives to him. In fact, I've taught my children since they were young to pray this simple prayer. God, give me the wisdom to know what's right and the courage to do what's right, even when it's hard. You see, character is formed in fashion when, we're, when we do what's right, not because it's easy, not even because we want to do so, but we do what's right because it's right. And being a follower of Christ gives us the understanding that we're to live a life in God's righteousness, meaning doing what's right, 
before God, more than what other people think, more than the opinions of culture around us, more than even what people in our own household sometimes may think. But because we love God, because we trust in who Christ is and what he did for us, being a follower of Christ is that growth and maturity to conform my life to his image. And that's what Paul is asking Philemon to do. He's asking Philemon to act on his faith, to actually imply what Paul had taught in Colossians now. He's asking Philemon to take a step forward and to actually do something with the truth that he heard. Because it's not about what you know the truth says, it's about what you do with it. Our lives should be lived based on what God said and allowing his will to be our will. That's what it means to follow Jesus. So the message today, the title is this, it's the message of equality. The message of equality because Jesus came on a mission with a message. In fact, the forerunner to Jesus' ministry, before Jesus entered into his ministry, his cousin John, the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah in their old age, would become known as John the Baptist. He came preaching as the forerunner to Jesus' ministry out of Isaiah. What Isaiah had said, that there would be a voice of one calling out in the wilderness, make a way for the Lord. But in that message, listen carefully to what he said. He said that, Every valley would be exalted and every mountain and hill made low. And the crooked places would be made straight. In essence, what does that mean in specifics? It really literally meant this. Where all the inequity in society is, that the mighty would be brought low and those that are lowly would be brought up because the mission of Christ was to create a level playing field for every single human being. Being. You see, the good news of Jesus was that now all humans had equal access to God, to his saving grace, to his accepting love, and all human beings were now given by God an equal status before him. We all become children of God, heirs of him, and join heirs with Jesus Christ. So as followers of Jesus, it's more about not just what we say, but how we actually live our lives and conform our lives to the truth that Jesus came to proclaim. And that's why it's important, listen to this, being, following Jesus means working to ensure that there is a level playing field for everyone. If we're to follow Christ's example, then really this is important. Let me say it again. Following Jesus means working to ensure there's a level playing field for everyone. Too often, we're ready to, to give that to somebody else. Say, well, that's not my responsibility. That's not for me to do. But here's the point. Following Jesus often asks us to step out of our comfort zones, to be involved when we see situations that are where there is inequity, to do something from our abilities to make those things not a reality for other human beings. Why? Because that's what being a Christ follower requires of us. That's why what Paul asked Philemon, because again, Paul's request to Philemon was not just for, 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 for Philemon to forgive Onesimus, but was to free him and to raise him up as a brother in Christ. We'll get into it. Look at this. We left off last week after Paul's prayer, but in, in the Philemon 1.8, this is where the appeal from Paul comes down. And he says this, he says this verse 8, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Don't you love that? You know, we, we often want that ability. We want to tell people what to do. But Paul here is saying, although I could because of my role and responsibility, he says, listen, I love this because he says, Although in Christ, I could be bold in order you to do what, it, what you ought to do. Look at verse 9. He said, I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Why? Because that's God's way. You see, God Almighty always gives us a choice. He always gives us the freedom to do what our wills determine to do, but holds us responsible for the choices that we make. 
Because you could not have love without the opportunity for choice. And here Paul appeals to his friend, to his convert, Philemon, to do what's right because of love, not because he's requested or ordered to do so. Too often we find ourselves waiting for somebody to order us to do something when we're not listening to our hearts telling us to do what's right. But Paul appeals to him on the basis of love. He said, it is as none other than Paul, an old man, now also a prisoner of Christ. This is so brilliant in the way Paul asks of him to do something that's going to be difficult and costly. But Paul now appeals to him that this is me writing to you. You see, Philemon had respect, honor, and love for Paul. Paul had led him to know Jesus. Paul had been a leader that had really helped and so freed Philemon from the guilt and remorse of his sin and liberated him into the truth of being a Christ follower. He held Paul in esteem, and now Paul's appealing to him in that fashion. He says again, it's none other than Paul, an old man now, also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Verse 10, he said that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. In other words, this is the part of the story that I told last week that Onesimus, although he had stolen from Philemon and ran away, he ended up in Rome and he got arrested in Rome and found himself in prison. And lo and behold, who is he a prisoner with? The Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul leads Onesimus to faith in Christ. That's what he means here. He says, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while he was in change. In other words, his spiritual rebirth, Paul, having led him to Christ, he was like a child of Paul's. Paul loved him. Paul cared about him. Paul had compassion for him because Paul had seen the change that had occurred in Onesimus. Onesimus became his son. So he's appeal. He says, I appeal to you all for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while he's in chains. So he's telling Philemon what happened to Onesimus. Now it goes on to say in verse 11, Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I love this. The word useless here, literally in Greek, useless and useful is the same word with just a prefix before it. The first one is a negative prefix. The second one is a positive you know, encouraging prefects. Literally what he means when he says useless was that he was difficult. He was stubborn. He was obstinate. He was a literally, proverbially, a pain in the rear end. In other words, when he was with you, you probably, Onesimus was in trouble all the time. He had attitude. He wasn't, he was, he was mean. He was unkind. All of these things are, 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 are a reference point to this word, useless, it means somebody who's unkind, it's difficult, stubborn. But yet, what happens? He said to him, formerly he was useless to you, but now he's become useful. This is the positive side of it. Now he's become gracious. Now he's become kind. Now he's become good. What Paul is saying is that the evidence of his rebirth is in the way in which he lived. Guys, listen to me carefully. When we receive Jesus... There should be evidence. There should be life change that becomes clear to others that something has happened to us. Jesus said it this way. He said, men should know you by your fruits. In other words, when we're a follower of Christ, character begins to be formed in us. And what does fruit mean? Now, love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, Self-control, faithfulness becomes a moniker of who we have become in Christ. Now it's the evidence that the Spirit is working in us. Too often we don't always understand that now following Jesus should show a change. Our lives should begin to be transformed from the inside out. And Paul now is attesting that Onesimus, who once was a proverbial pain in the rear end, now is the most amenable, the most meek, the most wonderful individual to work with. He has become dear to me. Paul's attesting to Philemon, change truly has occurred in this young man. 
something God is the Bible. See, guys, Scripture says to us that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things become new. If you've ever bought into the idea or the line that, hey, I was born this way, I'll always be this way, you need to recognize if you're born again, no, don't make excuses to where you once were. Now in Christ, you have the Spirit of God living in you. Where you, what you once struggled with before, now you are no longer alone. And now because of Christ living in you, because of the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, there is the opportunity that our lives can be transformed and changed. Because that's what it means, being a follower of Jesus. There's a, con a conforming of our lives, a, a work of the Spirit that happens in us. We all love to talk about the work of the Spirit happens through us. But I believe this, that more we would see of the Spirit working through us if we allowed more of the Spirit to work in us, to change us from the inside out. Because that's what God is. When you, when you trust in God's love, you realize that anything that God asks you to do that even may be uncomfortable to you is because he loves you and because he knows what's best. And there's a trust that it's because it's God who's asking him, he knows what's best for me more than I do. But here, Paul is attesting to this change in this young man, Onesimus. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. In other words, he's been a benefit to me, Philemon, and I believe he will be to you now as well. He goes on to say in verse 12, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. See, Paul recognizes that Philemon honors and respects who Paul is, and Paul is now vouching for Onesimus. He's putting it out there and saying, listen, I love this man dearly. So when you accept him, you are actually accepting me. Imagine if we in the body of Christ had relationships so strong that we stood up for one another instead of stabbing one another in the back. Do you ever notice that the armor of God has nothing on the backside of it? Because God never intended that we would be running away, nor did he expect each of us to use the sword of the Spirit in, an, in a contrary way to stab one another in the back. No, we're to honor, respect, love and stand for one another. Isn't that what it means to be family? Isn't that what it means to show love even when it's difficult? But Paul is here saying, Onesimus, he is, he is my heart. I love this man so much. That had to impact Philemon huge. So go on and he said this, verse 13. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he would take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. In other words, Philemon, I know you love me. I know you would do anything for me. And now Onesimus has been a servant to me. He has been so powerfully effective in helping me in my mission. I would like to keep him here, but I'm sending him back to you. And look what he goes on to say in verse 14. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. In other words, again, the appeal to love. I don't want you to do it because I'm asking you to do it. I want you to do it because of your heart, because you recognize it's the right thing to do, that you recognize that that's what Christ would want of you to do. Paul is here saying to him, listen, I'm not wanting you. I'm not calling in a favor that you do this on my behalf because I'm making you do it. I'm forcing you to do it. No, I'm appealing to you in love and I want you to do this voluntarily. And now we get to the true appeal. Look at this next part. Verse 15, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that he might, you might have him back forever. Verse 16, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, a dear brother. In other words, this is where Paul hits a nerve. This is where the wrecking ball to all of the social structures of the ancient world that used to classify people by worth based on who they were, what, what background they were, what, what, what heritage they came from or whatever else. Now, what Paul is saying is that he's coming back to you not 
to be your slave, but I want you to free him. I want you to make him your brother. He's a very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Verse 17. Look at this. He said, he's very dear to me, even dearer to you. I want you to pick this up, up as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. In other words, Philemon, because he's now been reborn, he is an equal to you. He is a new creation just like you. Now, your faith in Christ is asking you to treat him as an equal. To not just forgive him and not just free him, but empower him, elevate him, help him, because now he's your brother in Christ. Look at this next point. That Philemon, the book Philemon, Philemon conveys that our spiritual rebirth makes all relationships equal in Christ. That's the truth that this book communicates, is that now, because of the rebirth, all of our relationships in Christ are equal. No longer is it about your social status. No longer is it about your occupation. No longer is it about how much money you have or what family you came out of, what background you are, what race or culture or anything else. Now in Christ, we have all been made one in Him. In other words, the foot of the cross is a level ground. It's a place that all of us, because we all shared a common heritage, we were all sinners in need of grace. And now through Christ, we are changed from the inside out. So in essence, this is why this was so important. Because look at what Paul wrote to the Colossians. He said this, In this new man of God's design, there's no distinction between Greek and Hebrew, between Jew and Gentile, foreigner or savage, slave or free man. Christ is all that matters, for Christ lives in all of them. In other words, this is the wrecking ball of God to all of the things that the enemy has ever used to divide human beings. See, in our fallen state, what sin, what sin did was divide human beings, making ideas that one's better than another, that, that people who were different were a threat, what, there was something wrong. In other words, now he's saying this, there's neither Jew nor Greek. In other words, ethnicity has no bearing anymore. There's neither circumcision or uncircumcision. In other words, religion all the things that people use to divide each other, now he's saying, in Christ, now all of these things are taken away. All of the things like classism, racism, sexism, uh, um, any of these things that human beings have ever used to alienate and separate, now this very verse was so revolutionary that now in Christ all are made equal. This was the message. This was the purpose. This was the intent. That now this multi-ethnic family of God would come together as unified and one in Christ. That there would be no preferential treatment given to any one party or one person. That all would be treated equal. All would be the same. Why? Because in Christ, Christ lives in each of us. So how can I treat my brother differently if Christ lives in him just as much as Christ lives in me? We are all together in him. And that's what this message is. This, our spiritual rebirth created this even total family realization that we're now all children of the living God. But look at this next part. This is powerful. Equality in Christ breaks down all that man-made barriers that divide humans. Our equality in Christ is what laid the wrecking ball to all the things that separated. But no, notice this next point, and that's this. Living the message of Christ. You see, living our faith is never easy. Living our faith is never something that's just uh, 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 simple or easy to do. Why? Because Jesus didn't teach that. The biggest challenge that comes to our faith is when you're in a position of power, what do you do with it? When you have the ability, when you have a situation or a status or some way, how do you act in those times? How do you respond? You see, following Jesus, the truth of Jesus is this. Jesus 
although he was in the highest position of all, took the lowest position. What? To exalt humanity up to what had been fallen. One of the most famous texts in the New Testament, in the book of Philippians, it says this, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be, equal, to be equal with God. In other words, Jesus never used his equality with God, never used the fact that he was God to his own advantage. It said, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of a man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. The message of Christianity, it's never easy. What do you do when you're in power? What do you do? In fact, Jesus tried to instill this in his followers the very night, what we call the night of the Last Supper. How did Jesus respond that night when he knew? John's gospel says it this way. He had known that the Father had turned everything over to him. What did Jesus do in that moment? As John 13 tells us, he got up at that moment from the dinner table, donned a towel and washed the feet of all of his disciples. The most lowliest position of all that evening, he their teacher, he their Lord, assumed that. And he said to him, you don't understand what I'm doing to you right now, but one day you will, because I am leaving you a model to follow. I am leaving you an example that you are to uphold. And that evening, he left before them this example that even when you're the most powerful person in the room, what do you do with your power? You use it to serve other people. Ultimately, the message of Jesus was that he came from the highest position of all down to the lowest to lift up humanity from our fallen state of sin and disgrace. To be a Christ follower is the realization that we're to continue to live out the mission that he began. So look at it again here. Living the message of Christ requires that the powerful use their power to benefit the powerless. In Acts, when the, when the gospel was, when, when, the, when the letters were written to the churches, one of the things that was happening in the city of Rome, when Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans, that the church in Rome had originally been more of a Jewish church because the, the message of Jesus had begun among the Jewish people and they began to proclaim it to the Gentiles that now Christ had come in fulfillment of what Abraham was told, that through him all of the nations of the world would be blessed. And so you had this mixture in Rome of a Gentile and Jewish church together, but generally speaking, the predominant aspect was Jewish. But in 49 B.C., or excuse me, A.D., 49 A.D., Emperor Claudius from the Roman Empire expelled all Jews out of Rome. For five years, the church had become predominantly just Gentile. And now when the Jews were let back into Rome, these Jewish Christ followers came in among the believers. But now they were in a powerless position. Now they didn't have the status. The church had become controlled by the Gentiles. And this tension is something that Jews and, Gentile, Jews and Christians have, have struggled through these ends. Because when you're in power, how do you treat others? And so Paul wrote this in Romans 15 and verse 1. Because of the struggle, he said, Now, you who are strong, the word strong here, some, some of your translations, they use the word strong and weak, but really a better translation is powerful and powerless. It's people who have been given power. It's the Greek word dynamis. It's what the Spirit of God came upon us to be able to achieve and to do. He says, now, you who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength or those without power and not to please ourselves. In other words, what he's telling us, it's not all about us. What do we do for people that don't have the same opportunities that we have? So in essence, he goes on to say in verse 2, each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. In other words, as followers of Jesus, we're to look around to see if there's disparity. What can we do to raise that up? What can we do to make a difference? Because that's what being a follower of Christ asks of us, because he goes on to verse three and says this, for even Christ did not please himself. 
On the contrary, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. That's a quote from Psalm 69. But in essence, Jesus said, listen, your problems, I'm taking them. The insults that fall upon you, let them fall upon me. So what am I saying, brothers and sisters, is this. The difficulties and struggles of those around us, have we actually even taken the time to know or understand? And are we willing to step out of our comfort zones to help others? Because those who have power, those who have opportunity, should look around to say, what can I do for those that find themselves without opportunity, without power? Because to be a follower of Christ is to live out this model of giving. That's what Paul was telling to the, to the Roman church. That's what the message of Christianity is. That if we're to follow Christ, Jesus came from the highest position of all down to the lowliest position to lift up. And if we're to follow his example, whenever we find ourselves in a place of having opportunity, are we even looking around to those that don't have opportunity and are we helping them to find level ground? Are we living out the mission and the message of Jesus? Because the message of Jesus is equality. And it can't be somebody else's responsibility. If we who have the opportunity... So let me, let me ask the question this morning. This is Black History Month. As a white man, I could never understood what it means to be a black man in America. But my responsibility before Christ if they're my brothers and sisters, is to attempt to understand and to figure out a way, can I do something to help you? Just the very fact that people shouldn't feel alone or feel like they're ignored or their situations are not something that somebody else desperately cares about, prays about, stands with them about, and finds to help them find a way forward. Imagine, guys, if the church of Jesus Christ had lived this message out over the last 21 centuries with perfection. We've had our sputters. We've had our, we've had our, we've had our times of where others have come in because it was the Christian community that led the way in the civil rights movement. Did we forget that, that Dr. King was a devout Christian and that other Christians stood with him? But yet, the church has had its problems as well when it didn't in those times, when it justified the injustices and the inequities in our society. But how about if we, the body of Christ, truly began to live out the message of Jesus in this fashion and in this way? Do we sought ways to say, how do we help others find the level playing field that I myself have had the opportunity to experience? Have I even vested the opportunity to know or understand where the others around me are at in this journey of faith? Have I taken the time to know and understand all that? You see, when Jesus is at work within it, it's never easy because when you have power, it's never easy to give it up, tr truthfully. And it's never easy to, to acknowledge the fact that, yeah, I need to use it for somebody other than myself. But the very fact of being a follower of Jesus, is when love begins to dominate your heart, when you start to look at the situations more than just my own current circumstance situation or the situation of my family, but we begin to look at the global realization that the church, the church that we're a part of, that we are a family of God. And where can I help my brothers and sisters in their journey of faith? Just think with me for a moment. What might it look like and what hope might we give to the world around us if we, the body of Christ, lived, out, lived up to the mission and the message of Jesus? As I've been imploring upon you guys, it's not enough that we just go to church together. But if I've gone out of my way to build loving, strong, valid relationships with my brothers and sisters that are different than me, have I taken the time to try to understand where their situations are and just seek God? Is there anything I can do to help make a difference? Imagine with me if we all began to live in that way. What might Jesus truly be able to accomplish through his body, the church, the multi-ethnic family of the living God? What might, what might, 
the people in the world be impacted by when they would see across all of these different barriers that the world sets up, that there's actually a community of people so in love with them. Maybe they would say what Jesus said, that they would know we're Christ's followers by the love we have one to another. I don't know where this message lands with you today. I know it can be a little bit challenging. But that's why, especially within this month, the idea is this. Have I built relationships in Christ in the fashion that expresses that those among me are my equals, that those among me are a part of my family, they're an intimate part of my world, and that I know them and they know me?